Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Very warm welcome to you. Those of you who are joining us on live stream and those of you here in the auditorium and those arriving, a very, very warm welcome to you. We are already over a week into Lent, if you follow the church calendar, as I sometimes do, a time when we remember Jesus' uh, 40 days in the wilderness. And by the way, if you have picked up any practices uh, during lockdown, you know, devotional practices, things that have found, you found helpful over this uh, very challenging time that you'd like to continue, you'd like to pass on, then do let us know. Uh, Karen has set up a thing called Living Lent, Sustaining Dis Disciplines, and you can let us know so, um, and pass those things on. One of the temptations that Jesus faced in the 40 days in the wilderness was the chance of all the kingdoms of the world and of their splendor given to him if only he would bow down and worship Satan, the devil. And Jesus says these words, they're recorded in Matthew and of course in Luke. But since we are going through Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, I thought I'd read him from Matthew's version. Jesus said, away from me. To that temptation, he says, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And that is what we're going to do this evening. To honor the Lord in worship, in song, in prayer, in the hearing of scripture, the word of God, in response. Some words from the psalm, Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. Just a few verses later. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Father, be with us tonight in our worship as we honor you and as we worship you only and serve you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'm going to hand over to Izzy, who I think is going to lead us in a new song. Yes, yeah, so if you want to stand, this song is a new song. We are completely exploiting the fact that you guys can't sing along to teach you some new songs. Um, so yeah, this is called Rise Up.
Let's just enjoy being in the presence of the Lord with one another. Honoring him. Praising him, thanking him. Adoring him. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Amen. Amen. Would you like to take your seats? Hmm. Well, it's good to welcome you again as you've joined us during the first part of our service this evening. <clears throat> and welcome to you if you've joined us on, on live stream. I'm going to pray uh, before we hear the message this evening and pray about the situation that we're all finding ourselves in at this time. We're going to take up our offering uh, now. If you could just put that on, uh, on the screen. And a reminder, those of you who are here this evening, there is an offering box as you leave the um, auditorium. And since we are thinking about budgets and we're thinking about this coming year, thanking God for all the monies that have been received and praying God's wisdom uh, on that. Let's pray. Gracious fathers, we travel through Lent as we travel, continue to travel through this wilderness called lockdown. Be with us more and more. Strengthen us on the journey. Lord, may, may hope Growing hope in our hearts not be deferred any longer. 
Because, Lord, our hearts grow sick when hope is deferred. May it come about soon that we will take these masks off and we will be able to sing to our heart's content and praise you, not only from our hearts, but with loud cries of praise and thanksgiving. Lord, hasten that day, we pray. We pray for our government, of course, and the governments of our world. And all those in authority, all those who are called upon at this time to make huge decisions, have mercy upon us. Lord, as we take this offering this evening and other offerings that we've taken, given to you, we thank you for daily bread. We thank you that you give to us blessing after blessing, but we remember also that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so, Lord, this evening as we hear Scripture read to us in a moment, as we hear this sermon of yours, Lord Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, speak to our hearts, Lord. Strike our hearts with truth and conviction and energy and enthusiasm. A prayer from Tim Ford that he brought for this evening. Lord, we've been looking at some hard stuff. (laughs) Every one of us needs to address and think about. Please show us how and where we need to change. And thank you that you never give up on us. Amen. Amen. Emma, I wonder if we could have the Lord's Prayer. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount, of course. We're coming up to this next week. We're looking forward also to having our communion, new communion table here uh, next week as part of our worship. And um, so let's say these words together, the Lord's Prayer. This is what we're called to pray. It's quite simple. <laughs> our Father, who is in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I've got a few notices to give, um, and then I'm going to invite Karen to come and just... Well, actually, we're going to have the reading first, and then Karen will bring the message to us. We have a... This is so, such a great blessing, that, that what has happened here. The hymn Sing Along this Wednesday, 3rd of March, 3.30 p.m. on live stream, and you can join in by logging into the regular web stream link or scrolling down our church website. And uh, if you know of a care home uh, that would be blessed by this, which they will be, then just let them know that this facility is available. Ring the church office. We'll give you the links. Such a vital, important ministry at this time. So that's uh, it's once a month this Wednesday at 3.30 And thank you to Sally, Trevor, Karen, and others, Esther, uh, who are making this happen. This Friday, we have a World Day of Prayer, Friday the 5th of March, at 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock, Millmead in person and on live stream. I believe that Elizabeth is speaking at this event. The service is open to everyone. Please sign up if you plan to come, but you can also just turn up on the day, and uh, for further details, see the article in the Millmead magazine. And again, thank you to Ada for putting the magazine together for this coming coming month. And then we have, um, delighted to say, on the 13th of March, we have um, part of our ongoing Shaped by the Word series. It's been going for many years now. We've, we've placed all sorts of things within this title. So we have Kim Tan 
speaking, uh, teaching, understanding the Bible through Eastern eyes. I've read Kim on this. I've heard him speak on this. It will be very, very um, inspiring and encouraging. And it's on Saturday, the 13th of March, 9.30 to 12.30. And that will be online. So... Uh, with an option of in-person if regulations permit. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So we'll pray for that. And then we have some baptisms on Easter Sunday. It was so wonderful to baptize, have that pool open. So we're praying that this baptism pool will be open regularly. Uh, Oh, it's disco. So um, if you are considering baptism, thinking about baptism, or just even just pondering, you know, what is even baptism about? Uh, Come and talk to us. And also, if you want to go on some classes, details are in the bulletin. And uh, as I say, Easter Sunday, we're planning a really, a really wonderful Easter. Well, Easter's wonderful, so <laughs> we're not planning a wonderful Easter. We're hoping to do justice to that, and uh, that will be part of the Easter celebration. Some of you will receive, if your parents of uh, young people, teenagers, young people, you've received a youth survey. We want our young people... We want you as well, and uh, your parents. You could even do it together. How about that? You could fill in this survey for us, this questionnaire. We'd just like to hear from you. We're obviously in a transition with Chris moving on, and uh, we're looking to, to just seek God at this time, uh, both in appointing a new youth pastor, but even before that, we want to really discern uh, God's, God's will for us as a church. So please fill that in. It would be really helpful to us. And uh, get it back to us by the Ides of March. Does anyone know when the Ides of March is? Any Shakespeare fans here? The 15th, yes. So the 15th of March, the Ides of March. Okay. We're going to hear Margaret Stubbs now bring the reading of Scripture from Matthew's Gospel. And then Karen's going to bring the message to us. This evening's reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, and then moving on to verses 16 to 18. Matthew 6, starting to read at verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So, When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what he's done in secret, will reward you. But when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray... Do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now verse 16. When you fast, do not look sombre as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. Tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full, but when you fast... Put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Some of you um, may wake up on a Saturday morning, if you're anything like us, and there's a programme uh, called Saturday Live on Radio 4. As we're making breakfast, half a sleep state, uh, we sometimes listen into it. And there's a particular part of um, Saturday Live, which is just called Thank You. 
and it gives um, the audience a chance to write in with people, strangers often, that they just want to say thank you to. Um, maybe they did something, some sort of act of kindness years ago, and this person's never forgotten, but they never had a chance to thank them. So recently, a lady uh, said, that, well, many years ago, she'd been in a treatment centre in Aberystwyth, and she was sent to Bournemouth to another treatment centre. And having spent three months inside, um, being completely looked after, it actually felt quite daunting to make this long train journey across to Bournemouth. Um, but as she got on the train that day, she happened to sit opposite another lady who was just really friendly and really chatty. And so that journey, which could have been a bit of an ordeal, actually became really enjoyable. And at the end of the journey, the other lady took out some freesias. I don't think we've got any freesias in here. Um, some freesias from her suitcase. And she said, I bought these flowers this morning, and I didn't really know why, but I think I must have bought them to give to you. And 15 years on, finally living sober and happy and free, this woman had written in just because she wanted to say thank you to this stranger. Secret service. Where does this all fit into kingdom culture? I absolutely loved what Esther brought last week, and particularly that image of Jesus filling out the Ten Commandments. Um, you know, Jesus has said, I haven't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And Esther talked about the um, raisins in Danny, champion of the world. You know where Danny's dad puts those raisins in liquid, I think, and then they sort of expand and fill out. And she said, that's what Jesus has come to do. He's come to fill out the law. And we are to live lives. This is all about a life. It's not about laws here. We're to live this sort of filled out life, a generous life, an abundant life, um, a bigly life, this more than righteousness. And the kingdom of heaven really makes contact with humanity when people finally yield their lives to God as king. They make him king. And he reigns in their lives. And the kingdom of heaven is basically God's redemptive presence in the world today. And it's already on the move. And it's going to be fully fulfilled one day. And when you are on the receiving end of God's redemptive presence, when he breaks into your life, his kingdom breaks into your life, then your natural response will be, Lord, what can I do to serve you? And at the very heart of this um, is love. It's a response to the love of God shown through Lord, the Lord Jesus. And, and lo love is, is a life power. It, it's not that we're thinking, oh, how can I try a little bit harder to be that loving person who loves your enemies? It's this love that's inside us is a life power. And if we are living with God as king, then this power will continue to surge through us and transform us and make us more and more like his son, the Lord Jesus. Dwell in God's love and the rest will follow. So much of this kingdom is secret. It's hidden. Think about the kingdom parables. You know, it's the salt. It's the salt that can be, can't be seen, but can be tasted. And the salt that stops the rot. It's that tiny mustard seed that can grow into this huge tree that gives shelter to many. It's the leaven that causes the bread to rise. You can't see it, but it's acting. It's the, it's the treasure in the field that's completely hidden, but when you discover it, you will sell everything in order to gain this treasure. The kingdom of heaven is hidden. And we as Christians are on secret service in this kingdom. And so much of what we're going to do will not be seen by the outside world or even necessarily by each other. So we need to be really careful, Jesus says, not to fall into the trap of living to please other people. 
of trying to measure what you're doing all the time in a kind of tangible way, a way you can touch. If you look at verse 1 in this passage, if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them. But verse 1, it basically is a, is a kind of principle for living. Um, and this principle then gets played out in different illustrations that Jesus gives about fasting and prayer and giving to, to the needy. But Jesus says this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. This is the kind of governing principle here um, for our lives as Christians, for, for our hidden or our secret service to God the, in this hidden kingdom that he's building. The message puts it like this. Be especially careful when you're trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theatre, but the God who made you won't be applauding. I love that. And actually, I think this principle perhaps was something that our parents and grandparents were able to practice better than we can in our generation. I think it's a principle that's not really esteemed that much anymore. Our self-esteem culture, which is, self-esteem is really, really important, don't get me wrong, but our culture will tell us often to, to, to shout in as loud a voice as possible all that you've achieved and all that you are and fight your corner because no one else is going to fight it for you. And you've got to push yourself further and faster than anybody else. And it might be good theatre, but God, the God who made you, won't be applauding. It's difficult. It's difficult for Christians. It's difficult for churches. You, know, you look through websites of different churches and, and you think, wow, where does the teaching of Jesus, this secret service, fit in here? Because there doesn't seem to be any difference between what the world is teaching us and what's happening in our churches. We as a church at the moment are looking at um, rewriting our, our, some of our website, our, particularly our vision statement. And actually it's really difficult. It's a, it's a fine line to walk between saying what you aspire to do by the grace of God and just bragging, boasting. And this, you may have felt this yourself when you're, I don't know, talking about the work that you do or your studies. You're in a class and you're trying to prove to the teacher um, what you've learnt. Or maybe you're applying for a job. It's a really fine line. I will never forget my first job application as an English teacher many moons ago when I was um, studying uh, a PGC in Nottingham, and I was working at a school, Rushcliffe School in Nottingham, and the head of English was brilliant there, and she very kindly looked through my job application, um, and I will never forget her comment. She said, um, she kind of took it, handed it back to me, she said, it's a fine line, Karen, isn't it, between, you know, telling people what you've achieved and, and sounding boastful. Ouch! Ouch! But actually, I'm so grateful to her. And she's right. We are not to be seeking titles or puffing ourselves up, even in the name of religious respectability. I love how Dallas Willard puts it, and I'd really encourage you to um, read this book. If you're interested in the kingdom of heaven, this book, The Divine Conspiracy, is absolutely brilliant. A real classic of Dallas Willard's. He said this, Jesus says... The children of the kingdom don't seek to be called professor or doctor, for you have only one teacher, and all of you are students. And you might think, well, what Jesus says here seems to be a bit of a contradiction, because only a few weeks ago we heard Charlie preaching on, you know, live like a city on a hill, and let your light um, shine before men so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That was only in Matthew 5. So, so what's going on here? Now Jesus is saying, don't practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Which is it to be? I don't actually think there is a contradiction here. The point is to live a life so that people, when they look at your life, will give glory to God. All 
the thanks will go to him. All the praise will go to him. And I don't actually think that Jesus is even saying that you should always hide your good deeds and no one should know what you're doing. Because let's face it, that would just be a bit weird sometimes. Um, Sometimes it's important that somebody knows what you're doing. It's all about the heart. Each time we look at these sermons, it's all about the heart. And for some of us, actually giving anonymously or doing something kind for somebody anonymously might be really important as a way of protecting our hearts because we know that we are addicts of affirmation. Um, This morning, Ian was preaching about the temptations of money, sex, and power. And I'm sure those three came up, uh, some blokes came up with those three. Because there's another temptation that many of us face, particularly perhaps women, which is the need for affirmation. You know, we can, if we're not careful, we can just live for the praise, the encouragement of other people. And in wanting the praise of others, what we're really concerned about is either courting their favor or staying out of trouble ourselves. But Martin Lloyd-Jones says, in the last analysis, it always comes down to this. We are either pleasing ourselves or we are pleasing God. Even trying to please other people is ultimately pleasing yourself. We're either pleasing ourselves or we're pleasing God. And when we want human approval, we leave little space for God. And he longs to come in and fill that space. But he's a gentleman and he will not force himself on you. So when we do good deeds just to be seen by other human beings, then God will step aside and he'll say, have it your way. There's no room for me here. And all the praise will go directly to you. And maybe your ego will grow, but your soul will shrivel. You know, God doesn't want to intrude. He waits to be wanted. But if God is truly to be king, then our whole reason for being and doing has to be to please him. And that means that we are to live for an audience of one. As if the only opinion that mattered... Because the only opinion that matters is the opinion of the king. That's what it means to live in secret service for the kingdom. I want to ask you tonight, when people are in a meeting with you, or in a class with you, on Zoom or physically, when people bump into you, do they get more of God or more of you? Who do you leave them with? And the fact is that God is king. And, and his presence, we are always in the presence of God. He sees our every action, our every thought. Nothing can be hidden from him. The psalmist says, where can I flee from your presence? And this can be both a beautiful thing and quite a terrifying thing. But when we work in secret service with God, we remind people that God is with them. God is caring for them. God is all around them. God will never leave them. And all the glory goes to him. I just want to give a few examples of this um, over this last year, which has been, for all of us, I'm sure, a very difficult year. I remember at the beginning of the first lockdown, a family from the church just dropped off a bag of goodies for our family it was so kind it was just and they'd walked it was just really kind full of things treats that we would love and they did it it wasn't a big thing they just did it and left it there I can think of times where people have dropped meals and they didn't know that I was really 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 busy that week and it wasn't like I couldn't cook for myself at all but actually it was just so kind to drop a meal off and they didn't make a big thing of it the cafe there's a brilliant scheme pay it forward uh, where people might leave you a coffee or leave a card and you can have a coffee just it's anonymous you don't know who's done it it's just a way of of blessing other people and In each of those occasions, I can think, actually, the impression I was left with was, 
Wow, God sees. God sees our lives. God cares. God is present. And all the glory goes to him. So having taught this principle, do not do your righteousness in front of others in order to get yourself noticed. Jesus goes on to give three illustrations And they are, well, they're kind of sustaining disciplines, the kind of things we might even look at growing in in Lent. Uh, They're not laws, um, but he talks about three things, giving to the needy and prayer and fasting. Giving to the needy. The Pharisees of Jesus' day did give to the needy a lot. They were really quite generous. Um, There's an old-fashioned word for this, which is almsgiving. We don't really use that anymore. But we know that God carries the poor and the needy very close to his heart. And he wants his people to do the same, to, to be really compassionate to the needy. And the Pharisees did take this, and they kind of acted it out by the letter. But how we do this is so important. Jesus says, when you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action. He says, these play actors, hypocrites, treating prayer meetings and street corners alike as a stage, acting all compassionate so long as someone's watching, playing to the crowds. They get their applause, true, but that's all they get, he says. When you help someone out, Jesus says, don't think about how it looks. Just do it, quietly, unobtrusively, because that is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. It's the hiddenness of the kingdom. It's secret service, in service to the king. And the Palestine, the, in Palestine, Jesus' day, there were lots of theaters around, and Jesus picks out this word, hypocrite, because it was a word at the time that was used for actors, for anyone playing a part. And it was actually Jesus, I learned this week, who brought the word hypocrite into the moral vocabulary that we have today. This idea that, that people can be two-faced. And what Jesus is saying is that God cannot stand it when we make a distinction between the face we present to the outside world and the person that we are in our hearts. God cares about the heart and everything else will flow from there. And so, well, you might think, well, okay, I'm off the hook here because, you know, I don't like to self-advertise. I don't draw loads of attention to myself. Um, You know, I would be the last person to get a trumpet out, the offering, and make a big deal of dropping money into it. But Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh, it's much harder than that. When you give, he says, your left hand shouldn't even know what your right hand is doing. That's how secret it should be. So not just don't announce this to other people, but don't even announce it to yourself. And that is hard. Because I don't know about you, but I can happily do do things for other people and they don't even need to know about it but I know about it and I can go home feeling really self (laughs) smug and self-satisfied that I've done all of this Jesus is saying no don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing and what he's teaching here essentially is to be self-forgetful be self-forgetful in a good way not losing your keys all the time. Be self-forgetful. Get yourself out of the way. C.S. Lewis it, taught brilliantly on this. And he said, anything that takes us outside the prison of our own self-centeredness is fuel for self-forgetfulness. So get outside every day and go and see something that was created by God that isn't you. And just give thanks for it. He says, think about the things that you do well, the things that you create, make. The self-forgetful person will be able to design the best cathedral in the world 
and know it to be the best and rejoice in it without being any more or less glad at having done it themselves than they would have been if it had been done by another person. Ouch. That's being self-forgetful. It's also being incredibly liberated and free. I mean, I just find that such a challenge. And I think that for some of you where you have incredible gifting, artistically or musically or whatever it is, this is something God wants to call you into. The art of being self-forgetful. So, a couple of questions for you. How, how easy do you find this? Do you get offended if someone doesn't mention your name when you've made something, done something that you know is good? If you don't get a mention, do you take the hump? Second question, are you an affirmation junkie? Do you spend longer checking the likes on Facebook than you do before your heavenly father who likes you a lot and wants to tell you so through his word? Third question, do you think you're happy to be a servant of God's until you're actually treated like one? I know this is something I struggle with. But if we live self-forgetfully, unselfconsciously, then we will live lightly and freely in secret service for the kingdom of God. Second, I'm going to speed up here. Pray with simplicity. Verse 5, and when you come before God, don't turn it into a theatrical production All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for 15 minutes of fame. Jesus had obviously been to those kind of prayer meetings. Do you think God sits in a box seat? So the same principle applies to prayer as applies to giving. Don't pray in front of other people. Well, God, Jesus is not saying don't pray in front of other people. And by the way, he, he encourages public prayer. In the middle of this sermon, he actually gives the disciples a corporate prayer for them to pray together. Our Father, give us today our daily bread. So it's not that he's saying don't pray in public or don't pray together. But instead, he's saying don't pray in front of others in order to be seen by them. Again, be self-forgetful. Don't be self-conscious. Don't be thinking, how do I appear to other people? Don't worry about that. And I can honestly say that for me in this church, I've, I've not experienced that kind of hypocrisy. I have experienced it living in other parts of the world, in other traditions, where it becomes really important. Um, you could be walking with someone down the street who's effing and blinding and sort of showing off about who they slept around with last night and suddenly they walk into a church and it's like a different person's just emerged. And you're like, what happened to that other person who was out there? Because this, this person I don't recognize. Um, prayer, Jesus is saying, isn't like some kind of divine slot machine. You can't just say the right words or say them often enough or scrape Um, on your knees enough or repeat enough Hail Marys and then get what you want from God. It doesn't work like that. God hates this. He said he hates vain repetition where you're just repeating phrases, but it means nothing to you in your heart. God will not be treated like a machine. He wants a relationship with you. And just in case, as charismatics, we think we're off the hook because we don't use repetition and we don't like liturgy, then be careful because we can all be people pleasers. Charismatics can as well. They can be very, very proud of their informal, extemporary prayers. Um, and probably even more so if you're the kind of person who celebrates um, and prides themselves in being informal. Jesus says the world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are actually prayer ignorant. They are full of formulas and programs and advice and they're peddling techniques to get what they want from God. 
Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you're dealing with. And then he teaches the disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father. This is the relationship that Jesus is interested in. I love the sculpture by Charlie Mackesy. Just such a powerful reminder. This is at the heart of it all. We, through Jesus, we can call God Father. And he wraps us in this embrace. And surely that's what prayer is about. Coming into the embrace of the Father. Hearing his words over us. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. In Christ, this is who we are. And everything else flows out of that relationship. So we need to nurture that intimacy. We need to keep coming into that embrace. Get away with God. Get away with him. Shut the door. Don't let anyone know what you're doing. And just spend time with him. God waits to be wanted by you. And if you don't yet have that relationship with God, then I'd really encourage you to come and talk to us. If you don't know what it is to call God Father, then we would love to see you on Alpha one day. This week on Alpha, we were reminded by Bear Grylls that uh, the gospel says, I am known to Christ, bought at a price, blessed with light. All of my past has been washed clean. It's just so amazing what Lord, the Lord Jesus has done for us. I came across this painting in Polzeth in Cornwall a few years ago. And um, I really, really regret not buying it. I came across it in a cafe called the Waterfront Cafe in Polzeth. And it reminded me very much. It's basically a light, an electric light over the ocean. But I had just been reading about the baptism of Christ and I was thinking how Jesus just lives under these words of the Father. He kind of dwells in that light, even going into the wilderness. Satan tries to tempt him, uh, to tempt him to role play before God. But he refuses and instead he lives in his identity as the beloved son, completely sustained by the Father. This is where we want to stay. And finally, fasting. The Oxford Dictionary defines fasting as a period during which you do not eat food, especially for religious or health reasons. Well, that makes it sound like a a diet could pass as fasting, which is good news for some of us. Um, But as a religious practice, people fast in order to grow in dependency on God. And for us as Christians to grow hungry for God's kingdom. And fasting is a, is a strong biblical principle in kingdom living. And it was something that the religious leaders were familiar with, being taught all the way through the Old Testament. But fasting in Jesus' day had become something, in, an exercise in exhibitionism. So it was a kind of contest of respectability. And the religious leaders had completely missed the point. So they would try to look as gloomy as possible when they fasted. They had even developed this special way of disfiguring their faces with these markings so that everybody knew that they were fasting and they were really miserable. Um, This is how the message puts it, what Jesus had to say to them. When you practice some appetite-denying discipline to better concentrate on God, don't make a production out of it. It might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. If you go into training, and all these things, fasting, the prayer, is going into training for the kingdom, act normal outwardly. Now, Jesus says, put oil in your hair, which in those days was, I guess, like washing your hair. If you did it these days, you would really stand out. I don't recommend it. Shampoo and comb your hair, brush your teeth, wash your face, God doesn't require attention-getting devices. And he will reward you well. And so again, Jesus is saying that those people who are just looking to get others' attention, they are already getting what they want. Their reward has been given in full. 
But do your fasting as secret service, and then your Father, who is in secret, will see your hidden heart and will respond. Because the secret place is where God is. And when we give in secret, pray in secret, fast in secret, we stand under the shadow of the Almighty in that hidden place, intimate place, just us and God. I am rubbish at fasting, so I feel like a complete hypocrite talking about fasting tonight. I think I've tried, I could count on one hand how many times I've tried it. And every time I have, my entire family has known that I'm fasting by the end of the day because I'm in such a bad mood. All I can think about is food. And probably the, the people who are actually really good at this practice are so humble, they would never tell anyone anyway. So I don't even know who to recommend you to talk to. But get one thing clear, I think, that Jesus loves loved food. Jesus loved feasting and partying. Um, And he ate a lot with people. Um, But the idea here, I believe, is, is that we are to be sustained by not the things that we can see around us in the material world, but by the king who made it all and who holds our lives together. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And if fasting gives me a hunger for that, well, I think fasting is something I'd like to try. And in the ba- in his, after his baptism in the wilderness, he learned this discipline as he was fasting of being completely reliant on the secret source of God and resisting the deceiver who tells you that you are only nourished by what you can see around you. It's not true. There is a king of this universe who sees you and knows you and sustains your life. Izzy and the band are going to come and lead us in a song now. And um, as they do, I don't don't want you to be left with any single sermon from this, this series, the Sermon on the Mount, with a list of rules. Because this is about a life. It's not about laws. And we're not to be thinking, oh, I can tick that one off the list. That would completely miss the point. It's just like the B attitudes, the beautiful attitudes. This is about a life being transformed and shaped for the kingdom. Giving, prayer, fasting can shape our lives, but they all need to be done as secret service. So this is going to lead us in this song, I'm Laying Down My Life. Now, and I'd encourage you to stand if you're able, or you might want to kneel, and let's use this as a response. Maybe close your eyes so that you can't see anyone else and no one else can see you. This is secret service for the king. So we're actually going to sing Rule in My Heart. Um, We will sing that song later, but they both really reflect the theme. Um, I think with Rule in My Heart, I'm really struck by the fact it says Rule in My Heart, not on it, not visible for anyone else to see. Um, But yeah, I think that it resonates really well with the themes that Karen's been talking about tonight. So feel free to stand, whatever you need to do to worship.
this discipline that Karen has expounded this evening from the sermon. Um, I'm a great fan of the writings of Brennan Manning. And a few years ago, actually the late Brennan Manning, he wrote a book, Signature of Jesus. And he wrote a letter in that book, a letter to the churches of North America. And in this letter he said, It is time to put away celebrity. It is time to put away success. It's time to put away all these things that we crave for. And it is time to embrace the ancient discipline of the secret. This is the most important thing for the church in the West. And Karen has brought this to us tonight very powerfully. We would embrace the way of Jesus. And um, if you feel convicted about this this evening, I'm going to encourage you just to hold your hands out in this way. And sometimes we hold our hands out like this because it's an offering to God. But actually this evening, hold our hands out as a response to the message that we've heard, that actually we want to be people for whom our left hand doesn't know what our right hand is doing. We live in this glorious self-forgetfulness, as Karen brought to us from the Sermon on the Mount this evening. And that's you. Just, just open your hands before the Lord. Father, we thank you for this message this evening, this call upon our lives to let go, to step aside, to enter into the secret place, a room, and embrace your embrace, to forsake the lights and the affirmations that we all admit that we crave and and enter into the freedom of being before you, being so overwhelmed by your love and grace that we're liberated to serve you and to love people and to live contented lives and to know, Lord, that whatever we offer to you, um, it's your business how you use it, where you take it, what you do with us. Well, that's not our business. And so, Lord, liberate us tonight, we pray, deeper, perhaps more than ever in our lives, even tomorrow as we wake, whatever we're doing, to know and to cultivate this secrecy before you and to find great joy and great contentment, that you would fill us to overflowing And then, Lord, we can love. And then, Lord, we can serve in ways that honor you and give you great pleasure and joy. Lord, hear our prayer for ourselves. Hear our prayer for our church. Lord, we're very conscious. We have a lovely big building. We have great banners. We have all of these things. But may the heart of this church, Lord, be conceived in secrecy. May it always be one in prayer. May it always be one before you. We ask this 
for the glory and for the honor of Jesus, for his ongoing fame in the world. As the psalmist says, not to us, not to us, but to you be the glory, O God. Amen.
Amen. Amen, AZ. Thank you for leading us this evening in the worship band. And tomorrow is St. David's Day. And congratulations to Wales <laughs> for yesterday. And I actually took a funeral on Friday for a 90-year-old woman, Welsh lady, never met her before, and the family. And I was mindful this evening to close with a prayer for the people of Wales. The last words that David said, apparently, to his brothers, St. David, really chimes with the message that we've heard this evening. Be steadfast, he said, and do the little things through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so this is a prayer um, from a, a Welsh Baptist um, minister. Almighty God, on this special day for the people of Wales, we remember St. David, your servant. We give thanks for his passion for the gospel, which helped to spread Christianity. We give thanks for his purity and simplicity of life, which enabled his pursuit of Christian perfection. We give thanks for his gentleness, but clear spiritual leadership. Grant that we may learn from him and respond to the words that are thought to be his last. Be steadfast and do the little things. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And uh, if you could allow the stewards just to usher you out at the right time. And uh, we look forward to gathering again soon. In Jesus. Amen.